<laughs> Feel like you've already been in church? Yeah. yeah. Always enjoy the music. Okay. We can look at the announcements there. Sunday school, worship service, everything's the same. Praise, Sunday school, worship hour. Kids Club starts on October 6th. Are you excited? Yeah. All right. Need to be in prayer for them, both the kids and the workers. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've got some prayer requests here. Uh, Doyle's son, Jake. I guess he's still making recovery progress. Uh, Martha Clinton, they discovered that she's got a spot of breast cancer, so we need to be continuing to pray for her. Uh, Sandy's husband, J.D., he's doing a lot better. She said he was out doing the weeds today, so he does a little bit and then comes in and rests and goes out and does a little bit and comes back and rests, and, and that's the way he should be doing it, so that's kind of a praise. Uh, Pastor Bob and his wife, Hazel, from California, they're getting ready to move up here, so we need to be in prayer for them to make the transition and make sure we welcome them to us when they get here. Uh, Pastor Wayne and Donna, as always. Uh, Riley, Tiffany, and the boys. Riley's had a pinched nerve, and we don't know if that's gotten better or not or what his situation is, but he can always use the prayer as they prepare to deploy out of the States. And, and poor Tiffany, with those four boys, I'm sure she's got a... An armful, so we need to lift her up as well. Uh, Vicki Childers and James. Uh, Vicki had a, what kind of surgery was it? Cataract surgery? Had a cataract surgery, so she feels like she's Blackbeard the Pirate with a patch on, so she decided she's going to stay home today and, and give it another day to heal up, so we need to remember her in our prayers. Uh, praise reports. Our church was represented well at the Hemp Sing last week. Uh, thank all of you guys that made it out for it. Uh, that was a great time. Uh, Joe and Kimber had great opportunities with their book signing yesterday uh, to speak to other believers and to witness to others. And it sounded like they had a good time. I know Kimber's exhausted. I don't know how you are, Joe Ellen, but you, you always get kind of tired after putting on your people face and being cordial and nice and everything. That's kind of hard for them sometimes. I don't know, Pastor. It's <laughs> Okay, uh, continued ministry opportunities, Boise Rescue Mission. Uh, you can see all the items there they're looking for as winter's coming. There's a basket or a box in the back of the church. Uh, they're still looking for supplies for Sarah's school, and you can go down that list there. And you can just contact Sarah if you have anything that you want to bring in for her school. I know they really appreciated the pencils and paper and everything. Scratch off the water bottles? Yep. Okay. Scratch off the water bottles. <laughs> okay. All righty. Any anniversaries this week? Oh, goodness. Oh. How many years? Ten? Twenty-five. Woo! Wow. And Owen's only what, 30? Owen's only 30? <laughs> okay, any birthdays? Oh, yeah. Oh, little man's had a birthday. His dad's going to have to come up and speak for him. Who knows what he's going to say? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Okay, I asked him earlier, how old are you now? Oh, now he's going to get bashful. I asked him if he was two, and he goes, uh-huh. I go, no, you're three. Dad said three, right? No. no. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, we'll sing happy birthday to you anyway. Sarah? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. 
Happy birthday, dear, bless you. Happy birthday to you. Yay! <laughs> I, I just want to play, he says. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we count it a blessing to be in your house and worship you, dear Lord. You're truly a wonderful and mighty God, and you're so kind to your people. We ask that you uh, be with these prayer requests we brought before you this morning, dear Lord, and, and touch each one as needed. We know that uh, you are the great healer and physician and that you can take care of all this stuff, dear Lord. And we just ask that you uh, be with Pastor as he brings the morning message and with us as we enjoy this fall day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, kiddos, you're out of here. Well, good morning. You know, I remember when Chris was a little feller, and we would tell him, hey, why don't you uh, invite a bunch of your friends over for a birthday party? And so he would invite, like, Bobby and Amy, you know, the Sarah and Henry. Those, those were his friends growing up. But I, I remember one year that his mom, no, we're going to get some of your friends to come. Chris did not want to have a birthday party. He was the most anti-social kid we've ever had. The rest of them were like, ooh, the more people, the more gifts. Chris, he was quite happy to get a gift, and that was that. So that's kind of funny seeing little man not want to. He did the same thing yesterday when they had a little party here for him. They went to sing happy birthday, and he buried his head in his dad's shoulders. He, you know, anyway, so we did make a mistake, though. Now you know why I told you not to teach him how to talk. <laughs> no. That, that, isn't that funny how they get that word down first? No. No. <laughs> I suppose. <clears throat> you, um, anyways, I'm going to go ahead and, and start the message. Ed, you're doing a great job with announcements. Thank you for doing that. Sarah, good music. Some of, those, some of those songs, that was the thing with the hymn sing. You know, the thing with the hymn sing is I don't know most of the hymns they sing. And when you do know a hymn they sing, the ladies go so high. You know, it gets so high that it's like, I'm not even going to try. Not even going to try. Yeah, they do. Anyways, you'd think by now I'd be better, but I'm not. I'm worse. It had been about three and a half years since the day he dropped everything he had ever known to step out into a life he knew nothing about. He could still remember Jesus whisper loud enough for only him to hear uh, amidst the crowd, Come, and follow me. Peter knew very little of what he was getting into, but something inside him told him this was the most important decision he would ever make uh, most important decision that he would ever make in his life. Now, several years later, he could barely even remember the days when his only goal was catching fish on the Sea of Galilee. He and the other guys Jesus called his disciples had seen the blind sea, the dead rise, the waves become calm and demons cast out. Even crazier was that at some point, Jesus had him actually doing the miracles. It never got old seeing the look of joy on a man's face as he walked for the first time after a lifetime of being paralyzed. Here they were in their third Passover meal together. Someone, um, somehow, it says someone, I don't know why I typo. You're supposed to correct this, honey. Somehow, this one felt different. As the guys found their, sport, or their spots around the table, Jesus didn't go directly to the sea. Instead, he got down on his knees next to the basin of water and began to wash the other guys' feet. The others, like Peter, were speechless. 
Jesus had spoken about serving others countless times, but this was too much. This was going too far. Peter was the last one to go. And by this point, Peter couldn't stay quiet anymore. No, Lord, he blustered, or he blurted out as he pulled his feet away. Then Jesus looked deeply into Peter's eyes, much like he had done over three years ago when they first met, and said words that once again would forever change his life. Once more, Peter slowly extended his feet and watched in disbelief as the creator of the universe washed the gunk in between his blistered toes. <clears throat> Today, we're on week five of our Made for a Mission. And today is why am I on a mission? In my notes, and when Joellen asked me what the title was, I just entitled it, Why Me? Why me? Why do I got to do this? What, what, why are you bugging me about this? You know? <coughs> I can remember those early days. Why me? I had a lot of those why me conversations with God. Why were all my good buddies either dead or in jail for 20 years? And you left me out here to be married to some mean woman and take care of all of my past debt, raise my children... I mean, all my buddies, they got, they didn't have to, they didn't have to pay, they didn't have to do all that. In my mind, I'm thinking, man, they got the easy way out. Why am I here? Why me? I mean, you know what, my friends, they didn't do anything any different than I did. Why did they go to prison and I didn't? Why, why me? I still ask, why did you give me a mean old woman? disobedient children you know why me isn't it easy today in this society to go why me honestly I've always been that way why me let's, let's do a little review before we go oh, it's not working Mike let's review Woo, week one alright let's go back to week one we said that we are all called when we first started this. And calling is not for the spiritually elite, okay? But for everyone who calls, listen, Jesus Lord, that's who's called. If you're here today and you call Jesus Lord, you're called. You have a calling on your life. He, he's not a respecter of person. He doesn't uh, say, ooh, I'm going to call Henry, but not Sarah. Okay, if you're here today and you're a child of the God Most High, you've been called to something bigger than yourself. Week two, we asked the question, what's my mission? We've been called, it makes sense, to call to what? What have we been called to? Uh, we said that our mission is Jesus' mission, so we better find out what he's about. Okay, that's our mission. Our mission. And remember what I, I really liked in week two when he said, if you are going to be my disciple, what, what do you have to do? You remember, remember what he said? We have to take up our cross, deny ourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. That's to be a disciple. Okay, and listen. Listen to me. I have come to believe that if... We, uh, if we call Jesus Lord, then you are a disciple. You are a student. Isn't that what a disciple means, a student? We should be students of our Lord. We need to be figuring out what he's about. You know, and so that, that's kind of hard. We like to say, ooh, I'm a Christian. Then for years, everybody would be, I, I got afraid to tell people I was a Baptist. I didn't realize Baptists had such a bad rap. Oh, you're a Baptist. So Joel and I just started telling people, oh no, we're just disciples of Jesus Christ. Just serve at a Baptist church. But we're disciples. We're disciples. And he says, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to lay down your, or uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. You know? And you know what? A lot of churches say, hey, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Rick Warren. Or... Or follow Phil Pittman. Or 
or follow Pastor Dallas. No, 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 no. You need to pick up, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. He's the one who's going to take you where you want to go. He's the one who's going to get you where you need to be. Not the pastors, not the denomination, not the people, Jesus. Okay, that's our mission. What's the next one, Mike? Ooh, let's keep reviewing. Week three, we answered the question, what's my message? Um, we learned our message is simple. We're just supposed to share how God's goodness has um, intersected with my life. That, that week, I kind of shared part of my testimony. And I have made it, made it clear because I think that's, that's our message, man. The only thing I got outside of what the words in the book say is my experience, strength, and hope in Jesus Christ. I know what my life was like before I met Jesus. I know what took place in my life to make me fall on my hands and knees to receive Jesus. And I know what my life has been like every single day since. That's the message. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. That's my message. And it has nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with him. He did it. He spoke to me. You know, I've read that book a billion times, sitting in jails, because any, any good inmate, man, you know what, you, you're going to go to the Bible study, you've got to get out of that cell, go to Bible studies, I read the book, didn't mean nothing to me, until like Peter that day, Jesus whispered in my ear, follow me. Has he whispered that in your ear? And if he has, what did you do with it? Okay. I'll tell you what I did with it. I ran from it. I ran from it. I didn't want to be Mr. Rogers. You know, I always seemed like the, all the people in my life who were Christians seemed to wear sweaters that I, in the wintertime, will wear now. <laughs> I just thought they were wimpy, man. I'm a Powder River Basin roughneck, man. We grew up on an oil field, and we did a lot of things, but wearing those kind of sweaters and talking the way Mr. Rogers does wasn't it. Okay? Um, but he, he said, follow me. Follow me. Not to mention, I had a wife over there going, yeah, you need to follow him. <laughs> you need to get it together, man. Week four. Last week, we answered the question, who's my mission? <coughs> we simply, <coughs> we said it's simply those around us that God has to strategically placed us around where we live, work, and play. Listen, so often I grew up, or, or not grown up, as I was growing up in the church, I suppose is the right way. Listen, I thought they had to go to Mexico to be on a mission. Right? I thought those were the people. They needed it. Those poor people are living in cardboard boxes. Surely, surely they need Jesus. You know, I've talked to some people who've been on those Mexico mission trips, and those people living in the cardboard box have a better relationship with the Lord than I do. True story. Okay, I thought that, I don't know what I thought. You know, I guess I thought I wanted to, uh, wanted to save the world. I wanted to keep people from going to prison. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to keep people from going to prison. And I can remember once I started get, getting to know the Lord a little bit, getting more excited and s seeing Him change my life seeing things that I used to believe. All of a sudden, I don't believe so much anymore. And if I do, I'm not so willing to fight for them like I used to be. And then they just slowly, slowly go away. I, my thinking changed. And I, can, I'm gonna, you know, I don't want to get political, but one thing that where my thinking truly changed was Roe versus Wade. I can't, I can't tell you how, how somewhere in this deal, my heart got changed. My heart I think that we were treating unborn babies pretty, pretty bad. And I am guilty, as uh, sure as I'm standing up here, on telling more than one young lady, here's some money, go take care of it. Okay? I didn't care. I just didn't want no babies. But that changed. It wasn't me. It wasn't that I got to a certain age and matured. It was because the one who said, follow me. Kept his promise when I said, okay, I'll follow you. 
And He filled me with His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit, since that day, has been talking to me, been leading me, nudging me, working on my conscience, working on my, on, uh, well, working on Dallas. Not so I can be a better Dallas, but so I could be a better uh, disciple of Jesus. Um, changed my life. You know, and, and unfortunately, you know, I have a whole bunch of children. I know, some people are thinking, Ooh, well, you know, the good thing about that is we got a whole, whole bunch of grandchildren who we seem to like a lot more than the children. But here we are, nonetheless. You know, my older children, my older children, I had this conversation with Ryan the other day. My older children grew up in the, in the, in the front seat of the pickup as I'm breaking into the bread factory so I can siphon gas out of their trucks. Okay? My, my older children were there when I'm out fishing. Oh, let's go fishing. And so you're gone for three days because you're too drunk to drive anywhere. See, that's what they grew up with. And then all of a sudden, one day, at about 12, 13 years old, bang, Dad, here's those words, follow me. And I start following. Confused my boys. Confused them. Because the more the Lord was speaking to me, you know what? We come home every Sunday night. Woo, guess what we learned, boys? There's new rules in the house. Right? No grace. We didn't have no grace. Man, I got saved. I'm excited. You better be excited. This is way better than, than smelling like gas for, for, for two weeks or burping up flames. They didn't quite get it. You know? That's good for you, Dad. Good for you. All we did was really confuse them. And I, and I, and I wish, I told somebody the other day, you know what, we really, we really did our older children disjust, you know, dis justice man we didn't we didn't do it right we let him down because what i know today about having a relationship with the lord was nothing like i thought that it was you know now fortunately we got my youngest son who's grew up in the church he never knew his dad i don't think christopher's ever seen his dad drink he ain't never seen his dad steal gas not intentionally i mean i might have done it but i didn't mean to you know, I mean, he has seen a completely different man. He has seen a disciple. He grew up with a disciple of Jesus. Where my other boys, they, they, were, they grew up with a hypocrite. You know, with a, with a thug. I know I'm five foot tall and people think, how could you be a thug? You'd be surprised. <laughs> right? That's what they grew up with. And uh, I can see today where that would be confusing for a child. But nonetheless, my story is still the same. My story is still the same. Um, anyways, I kind of went back to week three. Um, I don't, what I wanted us to understand in this message is who's our mission is everybody's our mission. Does that mean that we, we put a, get naked and put one of those drums on us that says, ooh, Jesus saved, stands up on the corner as true as that may be, and maybe somebody's being called to do that, but I don't think the majority of us are. As a matter of fact, what I think a lot of these people are out here with the, with the signs and, and banging on the tambourines and all this, they make a mockery of my God. It's almost, it's almost embarrassing for me to see the way some of these behave, and yet we're supposed to, oh, aren't they bold? No, man, you are turning everybody off. Okay? You're turning everybody off, even with the co-workers that every time, every time that they, every time you say hello, oh, hey, Jesus loves you. Okay, they want to make sure. And it's true, Jesus loves you. But, but you know what? There's a way to do this. You don't have to go to Mexico. Okay? You don't have to change a whole lot in your life at all. Except for to do what I asked you to do last week. I was going to ask that. How does that go on? Last week I asked you all to join Joel and I in a prayer. So Lord, I don't ask you for much of you today, except will you have my heart become like yours for the lost? See, we need to, my heart needs to change for the lost, and I think many of you do too, for the, for the lost. Give me the heart of the Lord for the lost. You know, I was reading a prayer book yesterday while Joellen was out peddling books. 
And in this book, it's, it was called Praying for the Lost. I mean, it was just a real simple old book. But the guy made a great point. And even back in the, in the 50s when this book was written, the, 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 the point was is that the church is spending so much time praying for a stubbed toe, praying for, man, can I have my rent paid? Paying for food. And those are all things the Bible says we should be praying for. But his question is, is what do you think God's really concerned about? Is he concerned about you eating today? Or is he concerned about that person sitting next to you who don't know who he is? Who is he really concerned about? Okay. And I, I, I just think the guy was spot on. When he is more concerned of that sheep who, who, who isn't in the fold or the, or the sheep who run away. God's concerned about the lost. I'll bet you there's 3,000 passages. Sister Sandy and, was, and I were talking about them. I'll, I'll, bet, you, I'll bet you there's 1,000 passages that talk through the, for the, through, the, through the Old Testament to the New Testament, God's heart for lost people. There's only a couple places in there where it says he's worried about what I'm going to wear. God, from the beginning of time, has been concerned about lost people. And I know that's a Baptist thing. We, we pound that a lot. And we haven't here for a while, but I think it was in this series, I thought it was time that we did. That we, that we, we, I don't know what the right word is. Be mindful of it. There's lost people. I'm going to tell you why I think this is so important for me. Okay? It's because there was a time when I was that lost person. And somebody understood the importance of saying, hey, we need to tell this guy. It wasn't my wife. Okay? It was, it, it, you know, I'm so glad that somebody told me. I'm so glad that somebody loved me enough that they were praying for me. And if you're here today, having, a, having a, any kind of relationship with, with, uh, with God, then someone's done the same for you. How remarkable is that? How, how remarkable is that, that somebody cared? That was one of the big things we learned last week, is that, is that the lady, the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus thought she was worth it. She was worth going out of, her, out of his way for. She was, worth, she was worth having a conversation with. And I don't know if we did a very good job or not last week, but, but I think Jesus thinks you're worth it. You're worth it. Those kids in here are worth it. Our neighbors are worth it. The people that you were talking with at work are worth it. Okay, this is an old thing, but how much we must not like somebody to not tell them how they can have eternal life. You must really hate that person, really not have any compassion for them at all. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that I've got it all worked out because there are some people I have refused to tell, to share my faith with. There is, I'm not, I'm not lying. You know, Ooh, somebody else will get it. Somebody else will get it. But those people keep coming back. It keeps rolling around. I said, fine, Lord, I'm going to do it. And so I do it, and then you never see him again. It's like, oh, that's all I had to do. That's all I had to do. Week five. Why am I on mission? Or better yet, why me? <laughs> you ever ask yourself that, Henry? Why me? Why is it my responsibility to say anything? My gosh. Open your Bibles with me this morning to John. Oh, wait a minute. Before we, yeah. You know what? Today we're asking the question, why am I on mission? Maybe while we are here together... And here, I think this, is, this happens a lot. While we're here together and we hear these things, we get pumped to go live, don't we? We go, yeah, that's me. I'm on board. Man, but just as quick as we leave the church on Sunday afternoon 
And Monday rolls along, listen, the, the craziness of life. Do you find yourself asking questions like this? Can't I just be a normal soccer mom instead of a mom on a mission? What's wrong with that? I was thinking of Tiffany. Could she just be a soccer mom? I mean, why, why would we ask Tiffany to be on mission? Do I really have to see my school as a mission field? Can't I just attend like everyone else? That's what I always thought. Why are you bugging me about this stuff? My job's hard enough. Do I really have to try to force spiritual conversations with my unsaved co-workers? You ever ask these things? I mean, you know what? You, we, we leave church on Sunday morning. I'll be honest. But before I became a pastor, I left church on Sunday morning wanting to save the world until Monday morning. A lot like Sister Sarah, the drive to the office killed anything that I had. You know, because I murdered people uh, like you wouldn't believe. All these things happen. Something happens. It seems like. That kind of puts a damper on it. Listen, as you're trying to figure this whole thing out, I want you here, here, here's a here's a neat analogy. As, as you're trying to figure this whole thing out, I think it's important to understand that Jesus is inviting us into a chicken pot pie relationship and not a TV dinner one. Man, hear me. You might understand some of this. You know, at a TV dinner, the food comes in their own compartments. So you could devour the steak, but completely avoid the broccoli. In the same way, we can easily break our lives into their own distinct compartments. You've got one titled family, one titled work, one titled um, friends, one titled spiritual belief. Come on, men, you know what I'm talking about. We even have a nothing box. All right? Men, we do put everything in a box. I'm guilty of that. And I thought that that, that marriage guy made a they had us rolling when he's explaining it, but there was so much truth in what he was saying. We compartmentalize things. And there's a, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a danger in doing that. Okay? Um, let's see, he says, in, in this image, you could have strong spiritual beliefs that come out on Sunday, but they really don't mix naturally with the other parts of your life. The only problem is that Jesus isn't interested in your spiritual life, people. Okay? He's interested in your entire life. He's interested in all of you. Uh, with a chicken pot pie, all the food is fixed. In so there is no picking and choosing. The broccoli, chicken, and carrots are all in every bite, whether you like it or not. The same is true with our walk with God. He wants our relationship with Him to touch every part of our lives and for us to get rid of the compartments. Does that make sense? It, does that make sense? Is that easy for us? I, you know what? My wife is spaghetti. She was just telling me spaghetti. Okay, I think this is easy. Men, I think this is easier for women to get than men. Okay? Spaghetti, they're all together. All touching one another. She likes everything touching one another. Everything. Right? And, and like, like, he's, like I said, man, we like things. Man, we like things. Hey, what do you want? What are you doing? I'm watching TV. Well, what are you thinking? <laughs> About why this guy killed the guy. I mean, I'm watching TV. You guys, I, I have learned after 26 years not to ask the wife what she's thinking. Because she'll tell you. And it's about 15 things all at one time. She, I just look at her like, oh, she asked. You know? I think women have a better, better and, and I think even history has, will, will show that women are better at, at, at uh, mixing their, their faith with their friends, with going to the store, with all this. We're men, okay? Well, I can't talk to him about Jesus. I'm working. <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> you know, I don't want to offend. 
Can't talk to him about Jesus. I'm planning a fishing trip. I can't do both. You see? Isn't that true? Isn't it true? I mean, we, we have everything nice and tight in our little boxes. You know, back in the day, Carl's Jr. had a, had a catchy slogan. If it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in your face. Did you guys ever remember hearing that? That must have been, I never did either, but, but it was on the, on the internet. Same could be said for us in our relationship with God. Listen, if it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in your faith. Right? If it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in our faith. Okay, we can't, I guess, there's really no such thing as an undercover Christian. Or just a Sunday Christian. I guess there, there is, because there sure seems to be a lot of them. But they are truly not being blessed or fulfilling their call. You know, they're definitely not the people who have denied themselves and picked up their cross and followed him. Okay. Uh, one of the things that used to just bug me to tears about, about public about uh, the public work, you know, I mean, we have the police, you have the fire department, you have teachers, the people who are being paid by the public used to tell us all the time, oh, I can't say anything about, the, about my faith because I'll get fired. Well, I don't, nobody wants you to get fired, you know, and what, what we have found out that that hasn't always been 100% true, but that's what they want us to believe, right? But I've just always under, didn't, inter, didn't really understand that. I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Let's, let's, let's read in, in John chapter uh, 13, starting in verse 1. It says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In verse 2, it says, Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas' Um, Simon Iscariot's son to betray him Jesus knew that the father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God Jesus knew who, who he was uh, so he got up from supper laid aside the outer clothing took a towel and tied it around himself next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples feet and to, try, and to dry them with a towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. In verse 8, he says, You, uh, uh, you will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. But he is completely clean. You are, you are clean, but not all of you. Verse 11, he says, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you. Are clean. You know, I remember the first time that I read this passage, and then uh, they tricked us to be in the play at, at the First Baptist Church of New Plymouth, and then they even tricked us further because they had me play Peter. And uh, so you kind of, I had to let these people do this, man. I had to let my feet be washed. I had to, uh, to see, man, what would, what would really go on in Peter's mind? But when you and the more I learned about it, I mean, washing someone's feet, because everybody walked. They, had, they, they didn't even have shoe leather express, man. They just, they just walked. And they generally would wear sandals. But anyways, you're going to walk in a desert for 10 miles and come into the house, feet be grubby, right? So what they would do is they would have a basin of water. And they would, they would uh, have somebody, okay? It was not the person whose who's home they owned who was owning the home. It wasn't the people inviting you over for dinner, washing your feet. It wasn't that way. This year was like a, like a scumbag job, man. I mean, it's like being a shepherd. You know, being a shepherd is, is one of the lowest forms of employment that you could have in Jesus' day in Israel. Okay? 
But these here, people have servants, whatever, come and wash your feet. And to have the king of the universe, the creator of heaven and hell, the one who, who, can, who can say live, and you get to live. Or he can say die, and you get to die. See, we think the devil can do that. He ain't got the power to do that. Only Jesus, only God's got that power, right? He knelt down and washed Peter's feet. He just didn't wash Peter's feet. He washed all their feet. He even washed the feet of the one who was going to betray him. You know what? For me, when I read this story and I started understanding, you know, the most frequent response people had to Jesus was utter amazement. How? To me, this one, this here... This here put right up into there. What, we're gonna, what we read about, if we're going to continue in John, is, uh, is pretty soon he's going to go to the garden. And then from the garden, he goes to the cross. And as he's dragging that cross down Main Street, and they've beat him, they humiliated him, they have done everything possible to this man. What does he say? God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What? Man... Where's Rambo? Where's John Wayne? Where's Clint Eastwood? They might be saying a whole lot of things in all those movies, but never forgive them, Father. For they know not what they do. I'm telling you right now, someone punched me in the face, I might punch you back. Not see. And after I punch you back, say, how do you like it? Hurt, didn't it? What did Jesus do? Forgave them. What did Jesus do here? Wash their feet. Wash their feet. He says you're not going to get it. But you will someday. They simply did not see it coming. Listen to what, what, what one pastor says about this. He says, has that ever been your response to Jesus? Maybe it was before, but now we've been at this Christian thing for a while. We kind of know the drill. Maybe that's how the disciples felt after three and a half years of following Jesus. Yawn. Oh, another blind guy can see. Yawn. Oh, another paralyzed guy walks. Oh, you know, that's just Jesus doing his thing. Right? This was something new. You're going to wash my feet? No way. No way. Um... I'm going to spend a minute here. Now, Nikki, I'm going to have Nikki come up. Now, she's not in total amazement because I had to give her five bucks <laughs> to do this. All right. You had permission from her husband. I didn't ask my wife. Probably should have. You know? Is it super cold? You put ice in it like I told you? You know, one of the hardest things, you know, we've asked people in churches before, hey, let's have a feet washing. If I would have asked how many of you in here this morning, not being called or offered five bucks, if I would have said, hey, Casey, come on up and let me wash your feet. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? I know if Casey was up here doing this and asked me, hey, Dallas, come over here and let me wash your feet. <laughs> no, 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 man, I ain't changed my socks in three days. He says, I know, that's why I want to wash your feet. humbling it's humbling and it's one thing dude yeah an hour ago <laughs> are you saying I'm a little long winded you know I think oops hey I'll take control of your leg <laughs> you know as 
I become a pastor, and I understand a little bit of this. I just remember as we went to the First Baptist Church in New Plymouth, and I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody. But the more we stayed, the more we kept coming back. They tricked me into reading the book. And when I heard those words, follow me, I remember my wife and I decided, and she was dead against this for years, okay? Dead against this. We decided, I'm pretty sure it was we, wasn't it? It wasn't just me. It's my story. I'm telling it how I want. We decided that we would get baptized, okay? And the people asked me, it was beautiful. We got baptized together. I mean, how cool is that? Being baptized with your, you know, your high school buddy and your, and your wife. To me, it was really, really cool. Um, but they asked me, and Joellen, why are you up here being baptized? It's a good question. Why are you up here? Are you up here because everybody else is doing it? Are we up here because the pastor said? Why are we up here? There came a point in Joellen and I's walk with the Lord after we heard him say, follow me, right? We, we heard him say, uh, or you know what? I, this is, he, when he said, follow me, what all I could tell people is what I'm telling you today is when I got baptized, is I felt it, w- it was my turn to step out and start doing this. Other people have washed Joellen and I's feet. I could sit up here for another two hours and tell you how that community and those people, I'm going to put this right here, how those people loved us, ministered to us even when we weren't receptive. You know, I'll just tell this quick story. They used to, at Christmas time, they would, they would, they would knock on my door and, and run away. But they would put a whole bunch of turkey and presents and all this stuff at the door. And this is how prideful I was. I went to Phil. Okay, and I said, Pastor, tell the people we don't need it. He said, yeah, okay. The next year, the same thing. I said, Phil, I told you. Tell these people we don't need it. The third year, the same thing. And Phil, Phil told me the third year. He says, Dallas, he said, have you ever thought for a second, about just saying thank you. Well, no. Didn't. So, the next time it happens again. So, right away, I run to the church and said thank you. They ain't never done it since. (laughs) But I think that washing people's feet You just sit there for a minute. <clears throat> you know, for me, it's easy to turn my mission on and off. And I think for, for most of us it is, right? But Jesus, listen, was always on mission. He was always on mission. Joellen, and, and how I can relate to that is Joellen homeschooled Christopher and Eli. And and, and when you're homeschooling, you have to take every opportunity and turn it into a teaching moment. That's how Jesus was. He took the the simplest little tasks, the simplest little things, and turned them into a teaching moment. So I might be able to check out, but Jesus never did. He was always on mission. One obvious difference was that he was God, right? Right? Uh, But I think it was more than that. He knew why he was on mission. And it was stronger than any of the reasons or excuses that could have gotten him off track. Check out all the excuses Jesus could have easily come up with to not wash their feet. He was having a nice meal. Okay, he was having a nice meal. I haven't eaten yet. And I just touched Nikki's toe jammed toes this is a party i don't need to think about serving others for the next two hours i get it if i'm on mission if i'm on a mission trip or at church but i can't 
Can't I just enjoy a Friday night with my friends? I could, Jesus could have very well thought that, right? The people at the meal didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve it. How easy would that have been for the Lord to say, Ah, ah they don't. I'll wash this, this good looking foot, but I ain't going to wash that. They don't, they, don't, they don't deserve it. Jesus was grossly overqualified. Huh? Could, what, wouldn't even be bad? Couldn't it be very well said, Hey, Peter, you got some feet to scrub. I don't know why he wouldn't have said that to Peter. He said it to me. Jesus seemingly, or seemingly, he was making no impact by washing their feet. They didn't get it. They argued with him. One told them, no, you ain't doing it. You notice Nikki, she didn't argue. She's like, oh yeah, oh, well you missed a spot. It was the five bucks. <laughs> Listen, this was a really undesirable task. Not to wash your feet, but you know what I mean. No human should have to clean the nasty gunk between someone else's toes. It's not as strong as the other excuses, but I bet this was not something he really wanted to do. Finally, he had a lot bigger stuff on his mind. Remember what he was doing right before, or right after this. What happened? We crucified him. We nailed him to a tree. And the Old Testament says that that person nailed to that tree was cursed. He, he became a curse for you and for me after he got done washing these feet. He knew that he was about to be arrested, beaten, and crucified. We read that maybe just an hour later, he is sweating blood because of the stress in his life. If there was ever a time to think about his own stuff, this would have certainly been it, wouldn't have it? And yet here he is, with every excuse in the book to not. Here he is again, amazing those closest to him. How does he do this? And this may be the most selfless point of his life to this point. How do I stay focused and passionate about the mission, even when I don't feel like it, stressed, or have some serious anger toward the people I'm trying to reach. The foundation of his mission flowed from his identity. Are you hearing me? I want to say that again. The foundation of his mission flowed from his identity. It's who he is. And what he's invited us to be is this is who we should be. You guys have heard me say this a lot about forgiveness. Jesus tells us, hey, if you can't forgive, he's not going to forgive. Forgiveness isn't something that the one who's, who's uh, denied themselves and picked up their cross and follow him. Listen, every time we've been wrong, we shouldn't have to go through a 12-step program. Why? Because our identity is in Jesus Christ. Our identity is in the one who says forgive. Our identity is in the one who says turn the other cheek. Our identity is in the one who says stop being so selfish. Stop thinking of you and your needs and look to them. Look to someone else. That's his identity. And that should be our identity. Are we going to get it nailed down perfect? No. Paul didn't, Peter didn't, none of them did it, but they kept striving in that direction. <clears throat> All right, Nicky, you can go sit down, honey. Thank you. The meaning of the foot washing, let's finish this up. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of other people. <coughs> I wash them where I'm at. <coughs> Thank you. I, for I have given... Okay, for I have given you an example that you also should 
should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. Go ahead. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I am telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Truly I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. The meaning of washing our feet is, listen, Jesus has washed your feet today. Now he's done more than that. He's washed your sins away. He has made it capable for you to have a rich relationship with God. If you, you know, we can't forget, without Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are Jesus' words. Okay? He's washed your feet. He has saved your soul. He is up there right now preparing a house in heaven for you. And all he is saying, shouldn't you do the same for someone else? Shouldn't we do the same for someone else? I keep to thinking about, I'll close with this. I'm thinking about the, <coughs> the people who were given the money. Right? They were given money and, and then they left. And one was given one dollar, one was given five dollars, and one was given ten dollars. Well, the one with the ten dollars, didn't he bury it? Because he was afraid that the master was going to come and be mad because he lost it. So he dug it up. Go, oh, here it is. It's just exactly what you give me. What did happen to that guy? Nothing. He got nothing. But the people who took the dollar and turned it into two dollars, he got rewarded. Listen, I really believe that the church, we... we Man, we become so flat, so dry. We, it's so easy for us to get, uh, get uh, our, uh, our priorities messed up. And I think it, this is a huge spot where it begins. It's because we don't think of others better than ourselves. We aren't concerned for those who don't know Jesus. I am more worried about whether, whether they're married or not. Oh, are they married? Oh, are they, are, are they, you know, we're all worried about these stupid little things. Do they know Jesus? Listen, your job is not to make sure they get married. Your job and your call and my job and my call is to make sure that they have an opportunity to say yes to the creator of their souls and the true lover of their souls. That's, that's your job. Whether they get married or not, leave that up to them and the Lord. Whether they do all these little things, who cares if they wear socks or not? These, this, this Pastor Bob that Joel and I talked to, I probably already told you this, I'll tell you again though. He, he, uh, he, he, he says, man, I watched you on the YouTube. He says, how did you get away with wearing shorts? In a Southern Baptist church. And I said, I just wore them. And no one said anything. So I wore them the next week too. <laughs> Those things don't matter. What matters is, do you know Jesus Christ? What matters is, does your neighbor know Jesus Christ? The people you work with, do they know Jesus Christ? It's not enough, people, that they, oh, that's Henry, he's a, he's a Christian. I, I mean, that's not enough that they know that. They, they, they ought to be able to say, ooh, that's Henry, he's a Christian, and he's really concerned about me not being one. Maybe not to the point where you drive them nuts, but you know, man. That's where I believe it all begins and all starts. With prayers. With the praying. Being on our knees. Okay? Pray for those people. You know who they are. You know who the Lord is laying on your heart, in your sphere, who need to hear the good news. Pray. And when the opportunity comes, say something. Don't just invite them to church. It's not my job. The Lord didn't put them on my heart. Okay? He, he put them on your heart and in your mind. Why me? Why you? Because someone's washed your feet. Right? Someone's 
fed you. I, I'll never forget the guy. I was, I don't know, I was about 19 years old, been on a bender for about a week, landed up in Douglas, Wyoming. And I don't even know how this guy found me, but I'm all wadded up. And uh, I guess I'd look like I was hungry, and I was. I was hungry, and this guy took me to his house. Couldn't believe it. He took me to his house. His, I walk in the door, and his wife was like, well, who are you? And he says, hey, this guy's hungry. So she goes in and cooks me an elk steak. That's as big as the plate they gave me. I, you know, that's been 40 years ago, and I have never forgot that meal. Because someone loved me enough. Someone reached out to me. You know, that's why us. That's why I'm here today. Okay? I don't know if you guys have had this happen to you since you've heard that, follow me. But after the crucifixion, the resurrection, we, Jesus and, and Peter have another encounter, don't they? This is after Peter denied him. Everybody ran from him. Judas Iscariot dies. He kills himself. Right? After selling Jesus out. Um, Jesus comes to Peter. And he says, Peter! Peter! Do you love me? And Peter says, Oh, you know I love you, Lord. He says, Peter! Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. Of course! Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I've told you I love you. Then go feed my sheep. Have you ever had that happen? I'll never forget the day Joel and I are laying in bed. And I snap out because I had that conversation with the Lord. You know I love you. Then go feed my sheep. If you love the Lord and you know he loves you, go feed his sheep. Bow your head with me, please. Father God, thank you. Thank you for giving us life. And not only giving us life, Lord, but giving it to us abundantly. This morning, I want to end this message, Lord, in continuing the prayer that I've been praying all week. And I hope that, they, that, that they, these folks have been praying. And we don't really ask for much from you, Lord. Our bellies are full. we we got a place to live. But Lord, what, what we really do ask is that, is that I can have a heart for lost people like you have. Give me courage, Lord. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. Give me the ability to step out and think of others, even if it's for a moment, better than myself. I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.